Okay, good morning. Thanks everyone for coming. I think we're, we're all here now. Today is a, a special colloquium for, for people in the Atlas group, but I hope that everyone else will enjoy it too. We celebrate 10 years of, of data taking at the LHC and more than 25 years of the, uh, the Atlas experiment. And we have invited uh, one of the founding fathers of the experiment, uh, Peter Jenny, who has finally accepted and will tell us his view of how it happened, why it happened, uh, how we really got to have this machine and this experiment that are now leading high energy physics worldwide. Um, I promise to be very brief, so I won't give you a full introduction of this curriculum. You can look it up on the Wikipedia, uh, it's well known. Um, but we did ask uh, the founding father of the Atlas group in Valencia, Tony Ferrer, to give a brief introduction. So, Tony, if you can come up. Where is it? So, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this event, which I'm very happy to participate. And welcome to Peter Jenny to celebrate these 10 years of not only data taking, some, some analysis and some the big discoveries. Okay? Uh, let me just say, if I can, this other one. Do you, you have to point to the computer? Mm -hmm. ah, yeah. ah, no, to the pointer or for? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so, my, uh, my introduction, he has introduced you, our uh, first uh, spokesman of the <coughs> My introduction here was to show everybody, of one, of, every one of you, why we are now celebrating 10 years of Atlas. And uh, my history, my personal view, is this one. In 61, Spain joined CERN. In 69, withdraw CERN. Spain, no, Franco. Franco. <laughs> in 1993, we were already all the, the little pieces of uh, remaining physicists after the disaster of 69. We were complotting to, to work on LEP because we, we thought that LEP would be the big machine the, of big physics at the time. And so we organized the Plan Mobilizador de la Física de Altas Energías, was the precursor of the most important thing that, that I am telling to you, that is the law of science in Spain, that created the Mobilizador Plan and approved everything. We were, in a certain sense, the initiators of this law. This law allowed having projects of very long time. In 85, we started uh, Delphi, 15 years, we built two detectors. In 92, we started the three Atlas. In 95, we brought uh, <coughs> 25 years with two experiments. So now we celebrate this. The most important thing is that we close, <coughs> we close in, some, in some sense the standard model. And here is the closure of the standard model. The closure of the standard model is the, this beautiful graph that shows you. 100 years from uh, the radioactivity discovery to, to, to the Higgs boson as a function of the Nobel Prize and the year. No? And, uh, these are things well known by you. What is well less known is what is the time that took us to discover the, the things either expected or not. And you can see, and you can see the time that it took to discover the Higgs boson from the prediction. And another thing is that, well, as you see, Spain starts working organizedly in <coughs> physics, in particle physics, in the years 18, but all the big ideas happened much before, 10, 20 years before, which is a, a, a pity from my point of view. So the history of Atlas is that we were founded in different steps uh, thanks to the law of science and the programs that were proposed for this. This was our group in a picture in the middle of the 10 years that we are talking about, which is already an important number of people. 
for a traditional group in Spain. Huh? The, the most important result I want to show from Delphi was six months after the <coughs> And there we measured, we, this, we in some sense discovered that there are only three families, three neutrino families, uh, together with all the other experiments. <coughs> and then, just by measuring the, the, the Z0 shape. This is probably for me the most important result that we obtained in LEP. Now, LEP is the machine that discovered the standard model. Because all the electronic and QCD aspects of physics of that were really settled with high precision. For example, the three boson vertex in the second step of lab. In lab, we had already experienced And what was the important discovery of Atlas in these 10 years? In the 2012 uh, discovery of the uh, Higgs boson which closes, in my, in my view, the standard model. It was not easy to find this uh, signal of uh, the boson. But there are other aspects that you don't know, that uh, Peter and me had to be involved in order to implement Atlas. <coughs> this picture that you know, not only because it's the uh, front page of one of my books, <laughs> but because there are, there are, uh, excuse me, there are eight, uh, uh, so, so eight, eight solenoids, uh, which are the toroid solenoids of Atlas, which are gigantic solenoids, which you don't know, but they, they are Spanish. And we, here you see, <coughs> one, of the, one of the first, uh, uh, Toroids arrived uh, to send thanks to our in kind contribution to Atlas. So, not only Valencia contributed to the detectors of uh, Taikal and SCT, but also Valencia, through uh, at that time uh, uh, chairman of the high energy physics program in Spain, contributed to the Toroids, which is an important step. So, this is the conclusion of why we celebrate today 10 years of Atlas. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, we should pass the word immediately to Peter Jens. Um, thank you, Don. Yes. So, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Tony and Marcel, for this introduction. And I must say, it's, it's a real pleasure to be uh, back in Valencia. Of course, the Atlas uh, friends and others know that I'm here, well, fre well, frequently, once a year almost, over the last few years. So, I will take you a bit on a historical journey of LHC, of ATLAS. Then at the end I would also have some, uh, some physics results, new physics results, but I guess we will be timing out at some point. So the plan is really to uh, pay a tribute to more than 25 years really of ATLAS and to 10 years of uh, LHC operation. I will show you a few examples of uh, technical challenges and then uh, we will come to some of, of the physics. If I would have to summarize somehow the LHC project in one slide, it's probably something like that I would choose, namely showing the accelerator, showing the detector, but we should not forget there are two more ingredients, of course, namely the computing, very important, and uh, of course all this was driven by, by the physics. 
and there was a lot of motivating uh, input all along the project from our experience colleagues. <coughs> so let me just, as uh, maybe not everybody is uh, familiar <coughs> with everything, uh, let me just on one slide uh, just repeat you what is really the standard model in a very naive way. Well, we have the three generations, the three families of the matter particles, quarks and leptons, they all play a role at the LHC. Then we have the interactions mediated by the force carriers, and in particular, what concerns us mostly at the LHC, and the electromagnetic and the weak force and the strong force with uh, the uh, carrier, the photons, the intermediate vector bosons and the gluons. They are described by uh, quantum field theory. And then finally, the missing clue, so to speak, was uh, the Higgs boson, which was predicted in the 1960s. So this is a kind of, uh, in German we say, Ahnen Galerie, the, the, the pictures of all, uh, well, some of the uh, most important people who really built the standard model as we you know it now. And for the quarks, then in particular for the boson of the electroweak interaction, the Higgs boson, the scalar, and then the gauge series for the electroweak interaction and the strong interaction. But I show this only to always point as an experimentalist, of course, to see <coughs> that uh, don't forget there are a lot of uh, experimental physicists who all along the way, of course, have uh, contributed in the sense of making all these nice ideas about the standard model real. Otherwise, it would have just stayed a nice mathematical uh, construct. OK, so let me now switch immediately to uh, the history of the LHC first. So how did it come about? Well, some of the key dates I will now uh, list. In a way, the first time one started talking about a Hadron Collider was in the late 70s already, when the community was talking about the LEP project, about the big tunnel. And in fact, <coughs> in the late 70s, there was a <coughs> ECFA, this is the European uh, Committee for Future Accelerated, uh, and CERN organized a working group which was chaired by uh, Professor Tsikiki, and uh, even so the, the book talks about LEP, of course. Nevertheless, it made clear that, well, it would be good to have a large uh, conference so that uh, at a very far future, what could actually install a Hadron uh, Collider in, in, this, uh, in this room. But, uh, but then it, people were skeptical about Hadron Colliders. Well, the history is such that in 81, LEP was finally approved. Uh, this ring, which was 27 kilometers, and very importantly also with a tunnel diameter, uh, cross-section, which was big enough to put in eventually cryomagnets in the latest stage. I think the crucial date was really in the uh, early 1980s, 1983 in particular, when the UA1 and UA2 experiment at the PBRP collider showed that one can uh, produce in a clean way, discovery physics by, uh, well, essentially in the same year almost, uh, by the discovery of the W and the Z uh, boson. I show you here, uh, it's actually an online display, 
from I was in UI2, so I show you a UI2 event from a C uh, decaying into E plus C minus. This is a calorimeter map and the 80 degrees of the part, the electron, positron. We didn't know the charge in UI2, but nevertheless, we measured well the energies, and uh, that was a very clean signal for the C boson. So that changed the attitude immediately towards planning and thinking or dreaming, I should say, of a uh, future Hadron Collider. And uh, this brought the community together in uh, 1984 in a famous workshop which happened to have, uh, which was in Lausanne, where the first time really experimentalists, machine builder and theorists talk together what could we do <coughs> after LEP. And LEP was not even yet started to be built at that time. So, uh, okay, one has to think far ahead. And only a few years after, already one started doing uh, R&D uh, based on money which came from outside, from the Italian government in a way. Uh, for detectors which one could use at such a Hadron Collider. So that was quite an exciting time in that sense, that uh, one was already working on something which uh, was really, by far, was not sure that it would happen. Then, another crucial date was really in 1987, a workshop in Latvia where the core of many of the senior colleagues now of the LHC were involved. This was set up by uh, Carlo Rubia, who was the Director General designate at that time. He was not yet Director General in uh, the Long Range Planning Committee. And, uh, well, history seems to repeat itself a little bit because of that. Uh, workshop and in working groups, he asked us to compare the physics potential and also the technical aspect of a large hadron provided, foreseen at that time at 16 TV in the left tunnel, and of an E plus and minus linear provider. Click, it was already complete at that time. Of course, one had no idea what, uh, what mass the Higgs would be, that was uh, pointed more to the low mass range after LEP started to really running. At that time, <coughs> uh, this was not known. So one was, for example, looking how would the Higgs signal be visible over the background if it would be 400 GB. So, so that, I think, was a very crucial uh, time and the conclusion of this workshop was really that the Hadron Collider is probably the most promising avenue for CERN to go. I just want to show you that uh, one has to be maybe sometimes a little bit naive and uh, enthusiastic about <coughs> thinking of time scales, even so reality may be different. This is a slide, I guess that I'm not sure exactly when, but that I must have done in 87 or so, about when would actually such a Hadron Collider start. And if you see here, 1997, we were thinking, okay, uh, the machine has been built, the experiment has been uh, assembled, and we could start. Maybe in order to still remain friends with the lab people, maybe still one could alternate lab and LNC operation or so. Of course, as you know, reality was more than 10 years uh, later. So, the next steps in the history for the LHC were then in 81, when the Carbonidia was DG. He managed to convince the CERN Council to make a statement which says that the LHC is really the right machine to advance uh, physics and so. This was not an approval of the machine yet, but I think it's, it's a, again, a, a very important lesson. It's good if <coughs> council agrees on the roadmap, 
where to go, what is the goal. And that was a clear statement in that uh, uh, aspect. Also, I show this just to say that uh, already at that time one was very much aware that one needs partner all over the globe. And Russia was, of course, one of the very important partners to help, uh, which we wanted to have uh, involved. That's so. Then it took another couple of years to 94, in fact, to come with a proposal for council to approve the machine. But then there was a problem. The machine was too expensive, and uh, the certain member states could not really agree to commit to the full uh, cost of the LHC. And so, very uh, cleverly, Chris Levin Smith, who was the new Director General, and Lynn Evans, they came up with a scheme which one could not actually do, namely the missing magnet scheme, which would have meant that you only install two thirds of the cryo magnets, and then just a cryo lab, rather beam pipe, a cold beam pipe. Right? So the machine would be not uh, 14 <coughs> TB, but would be rather 10 TB. And I remember very well uh, times when we with uh, great urgency had to provide plots to convince council that, well, it's also worthwhile to work with uh, MD. This is the, for example, the cross-section for a heavy W prime in the case of uh, 14 TV and uh, 10 TV. As you know, uh, it's a bit ironic, but for all the reasons then we had to run that lower energy uh, for quite a while. Also, not everybody agreed in council when the proposal was made in June, and this is another oddity, a historical thing. Uh, they interrupted the council <coughs> session for half a year, just to make, uh, the voting was interrupted, and they came back half a year later, there were two main sessions of council to approve the machine. And that was then really happening at the end of the year 94. But of course, as I said, if this machine could not have been built. The idea was that one would go out and uh, look for partners, non-member state partners, uh, to contribute to the machine, which uh, big effort was done both by the management and the experiments to find uh, non-member state partners, for example, uh, Japan. And so in 96, then the project as it is now, the LHC, was really approved. At that time, the <coughs> projected start uh, was 205. OK, so now I should start about the LHC. And maybe I should say that in, in the early 90s, the LHC, there were two things. There was a machine. I'll talk about that later. There was also a girls' band at CERN, which was called Les Ovins Les Cernettes. And they were quite good, and I liked them. There's another picture of them. And I show this because this is actually said to be the first picture which was available on the, on the web. So it's a historical meaning, and just to say that uh, early this year, actually, Fabiola uh, Giannotti, Jim Dallas' means, were celebrating the 30 years of the web. OK, after that, let's come to the LHC. The LHC is the machine which is in the former lab panel of 27 kilometers, typically 100 meters uh, underground. <coughs> Maybe just a few facts to it. <coughs> well, the, the main component that is 1,232 cryo magnets. These are twin magnets which uh, make a field of about 8.3 tesla. Uh, these are the two vacuum <laughs> pipes here. In one pipe, the field goes down, in the other, it goes up. And you can figure out that you need, uh, you need this to have counter rotating uh, protons. You see here also a picture of the project leader who constructed really the LHC of uh, Lee Well, 
it was a long story to build the cryomagnets, to install them, and so that lasted typically from 2000 to uh, 2007, 2008. In fact, there was just one place where they could be lowered, and then they had to be transported, well, 13 and a half kilometers in the longest way, and placed them. There are other elements to the machine which are very important. I can show you the two most uh, prominent ones. One is the place where the particles are accelerated. These are superconducting cavities. They, were, they are installed in point four of this eightfold uh, symmetry ring. That is where the Aleph experiment was uh, previously uh, sitting. And uh, what happens is in these cavities, the proton <coughs> every time, 11,000 times per second, uh, a kick when they come through. So that's where they are accelerated and then kept at the energy. The other point, very important, are the focusing elements in front of the detectors in order to uh, achieve the highest possible interaction rates because the physics we are looking at is uh, very there. And again, I show this because in present discussion about future accelerators, of course, one would expect contributions from all over the globe to not only the detectors, but also to the accelerators. <coughs> For example, these focusing elements, they have been built jointly by Japan and uh, by the US. These were very important uh, contributions to the machine. Of course, the LHC profited from the fact that there was a big accelerator infrastructure at CERN, which is used as free accelerators. And uh, I can just show this uh, cartoon here from uh, RINAC, which is by the way upgraded now, to the PS, to the booster, to the SPS. This was the machine of the PYP collider, and then they are injected into the LHC ring. I said that uh, you need very high intense intensity in the collisions. In fact, uh, to put some numbers behind that, we need to collide roughly 10 to the 13 pairs of protons to find one Higgs particle that we can really detect in the detector. So you need really a lot of uh, interactions and of course that means a lot of uh, requirements for the detectors. <coughs> so let us look a little bit about the detectors and and again, today, everybody takes it for granted that uh, we have these sophisticated instruments like ATLAS, CMS, and, and the other experiments. That was not completely obvious in the very beginning. In fact, uh, Carlo argued that, well, one experiment should just be a, an iron ball, where you absorb everything except for the muons, which come up. And, uh, with that, well, you could have actually discovered the Higgs, probably. Maybe found if it would exist a Z prime, which decays in mu plus mu minus, but that would be all. And then there were some younger guys, like me writing in hand still here, arguing that no, you want really much more sophisticated experiments to increase the possibility about the physics. <coughs> Today, nobody would ever think of making just a, such a simplified experiment as Carlo, but you know, when you're the first time, maybe uh, looks different. So what happens on the experimental side is, well, there was actually a study week in Barcelona, which was very important, because in order to compete with, at that time still, being prepared SSC at, uh, in, in the United States, which would have had 40 TV collisions, 
we could only beat them when we have higher intensity. So there was a special workshop on, on seeing how high they can go in instrumentation for uh, high intensity uh, detectors. Then there was, in the 90s, a very important workshop where really uh, people have come with all the physics studies, with all the detective concept studies or so. And uh, that happened in Aachen. And uh, at that time, there were already kind of protocol operations being uh, formed. And the CERN and again this uh, ECFA uh, committee, they called for expression of interest at the famous meeting which was in Libya. And that's really uh, thought to be the kickoff when, when the experiments came. And in fact, at that uh, meeting, there were expression of interest for the general purpose detectives. There were four. Somebody asked me just uh, during the coffee. And it was so very clear to everybody, four would not be affordable. One would be probably not enough. You want two experiments to check each other. So two of these experiments, namely uh, Eagle and Ascot, both based on a configuration with uh, with uh, toroids, a magnet configuration with toroids, they joined forces. For those who are thinking again about future experiments, joining forces with, with two collaborations which have already had their life for a couple of years, is not an easy thing. So one has to think very early how one does that. Uh, these are just the concepts of the Eagle and Ascot. One had a superconducting uh, toroid that very little other detectives, not very sophisticated. One had a sort of crude toroid that was hit on, but a lot of uh, good calorimetry and, and tracking. And so we joined these, uh, these two things. And in fact, only within half a year, we had to submit a letter of intent. And that is really the birth of, of Atlas. This was in uh, October 92. And uh, one could say that uh, was really the start. At that time, there were two other letters of intent, one CMS and one called L3 plus 1, the two solenoid detectors, and they could not agree. And so there it was left to the committee to choose one of the two. And we all know which one uh, was finally chosen. <coughs> So, these are the two general purpose detectives, and I will not say much more uh, about CMS, of course. Time does not permit. And uh, later, from the other experimental ideas, uh, emerged two other uh, detectors, specialized detectors, somewhat smaller in size, typically a factor of five in cost, if you want to argue in these terms. One for B physics, LHCB, and I know there is a group here doing beautiful B physics, uh, but that's outside the scope of this talk, and one uh, dedicated to heavy ions. So I will now <coughs> talk about uh, ATLAS. This is the collaboration as it stands now with the uh, three Spanish institutions, and I must say Valencia is really a very, very strong partner, also uh, Barcelona and a somewhat smaller but still very active group. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So we are about 3,900 scientific authors and uh, a lot of students. They do deal with a large part of the work. So after this uh, expression of interest in 92, we were finally encouraged to make a technical proposal, which was in 94. And then in 95, it took a long time to discuss with the peer review committees. 
in 95, finally, at the end of 95, this was the first piece of paper which said that uh, we will get approved. It was an official link by the main referee for, for Atlas, by Montgomery. It was very really nice to get this. <coughs> and uh, we were invited then to produce the technical design reports. And the first one were really on, on the uh, calorimeters. And so the final real approval was only in July 97 when Gucci uh, at that moment approved us for construction and also imposed a limit what the experiment can cost. And I think, again, this will be something which uh, those of you who think of a future detector, they will have to uh, cope with that. It was not so simple to, to reach this, this limit, and let me say something about that. So, 97 approval of, of uh, Atlas and CMS to go ahead, and that was also necessary because the civil engineering had to start for the patents. <coughs> in fact, this started uh, just a year after for Atlas. It's a very big cannon, about 50 meters long, <coughs> 40 meters, 35 meters <coughs> And it took about five years to <coughs> In fact, this shows you a picture in the beginning of 2003 when um, concreting and all this was already done. And the, the company was then handed over to the collaboration in, uh, in summer of uh, 2003. Maybe a few of the uh, most challenging technical uh, systems. Well, one is the big toroid magnet, it's a magnet system, it has a barrel toroid and two end cap toroids. These are about 26 meters long, 5 meters in this direction. <coughs> Time does not a big, you need to go in detail, but that's uh, certainly a, a very large engineering uh, object. In fact, I was saying we had a cap on the cost. Initially, we wanted to have something like uh, 12 coils, and finally ended up with 8, just to reduce the cost. But I think it was even good because uh, this meant that there was less obstructed space, because it's an air core so we wanted to have the field without material, if possible, to have high resolution neon measurements. And, uh, uh, initially, we wanted more coins because the field would be more homogeneous than what we have now, but we can live with that very well. So there was a big construction years of all these coins. They were assembled at CERN and also tested to something like 22 kiloamps. And indeed, uh, Tony has already shown that uh, the vacuum vessels here they were built by uh, Spanish. In this well, here you see the transport of such a coin, and then what happened in the year 2004, 2005, I can show in a couple of seconds, was took one year to build up this story to come to this famous uh, picture. Uh, maybe we go from the story inside. There is the calorimeter, and the calorimeter, of course, is particularly close to the heart of uh, Tony, in particular the hadron calorimeter, which is uh, time calorimeter. I'll say a bit more about that. Inside is a liquid hadron calorimeter. So it's a hybrid calorimeter which we finally choose. And uh, maybe on this picture, I can say uh, one of these extended bio cylinders was built in Spain, one in the US, and the central part more in Russia and Central Europe. What was also special is that we had a solenoid inside, which was produced fully in Japan, delivered as a, as a piece, and that was the first detector coming to, to Atlas, actually, and here we see how it's 
inserted into the cryostat of the liquid atom battery. Well, the dark calorimeter, of course, you know all this here. It uh, was invented especially in R&D for the LHC, with this uh, very clever arrangement of the scintillators in the wrong direction. Uh, and uh, of course, there are several sites, and one of the sites to be built, uh, these submodules, here you see where the scintillator gets. Uh, inserted was, was here actually in Valencia. Tony and uh, the project leader at that time, Matthew Messi, and, and maybe some of you are around there. <laughs> so this was the first active uh, detector which was actually put into uh, the cabin in 2004. Let's make a jump to 2007. That is uh, the total built up here, one of the uh, cylinders of the end caps, maybe the Spanish one. I'm not sure if the Spanish one is on A or C side, but who cares? They are identical. <laughs> but, but you see here, here something is still missing, and what is missing is uh, the very sophisticated inner detector, which initially had three uh, layers of uh, pixels. Now we have four layers after the upgrade, uh, phase zero upgrade. Then we have the uh, silicon strip detector, both in the panel and the rings in the end caps. And then outside here in yellow is the uh, transition radiation detector. And of course, uh, that's the other very strong contribution from uh, Valencia is, of course, in the silicon uh, SCT construction and, and also integration. So you see Pepe, for example, uh, smiling. And don't tell me, I know that this is the pattern. And it's not that, but never mind. <laughs> uh, OK, so just to show you, there was a lot of uh, activities in clean rooms. And, and in fact, the first one went in in May 2007. So maybe uh, very briefly, the overall detector in rough numbers has about 100 million <coughs> channels. And I think it's almost a miracle how well these detectors work with so many channels and everything. So, of course, it's a huge amount of work, maintenance work, keeping it running, and uh, having this act, you can see, for example, high economy, 99.5% of the channels running, or in the SCT, right, here also 99% essentially. And I think I want to show two more things which are usually not so much talked about in these experiments, but which are also very, very essential is there is enormous amount of services which have to be done. And electricity, cooling pipes, fibers to read the signals and all that. So you, you can see here some numbers. There's more than 50,000 the cables and pipes which have been installed. This was a huge work. It will be underestimated when planning future experiments. And maybe I also want to show you this, which uh, is less fun. Fortunately, the young physicists don't have to deal with that, namely the funding. You have to find the money. And uh, this shows you over the years, 95, when we really started, up to 2010, uh, paying for the experiment. What is shown in yellow is what we have foreseen <coughs> in, the in the memorandum of understanding, and here you find back this cap of 475 million Swiss francs, and of course at that time we were told not to send more, and so on. <coughs> Now, this is the red curve shows you how we actually 
spent the money and constructed, so you can already see we were somewhat slower than foreseen. But also at some point, of course, one started seeing that the, the, the overall thing costs more than what was. And that was a hard time. That fell in the same time when also the LHC costs grew. And so we were, of course, competing with the, with the ministries and so uh, you know, for the money. But all in all, we did get this one. It was not called over cost. The term which was used was cost to completion. And uh, so, well, after all, it's, a, it's not such a big, big deal if you want. It's not even 20%, uh, but still. It's not so easy to get them. So then in 2008, in uh, summer, finally everything was there. We were uh, ready, also in the control room, for example. The uh, Valencia University Chancellor was, was uh, visiting uh, Atlas to, to get the introduction for taking shifts, maybe. You can see here was one of some of our friends again. But, uh, okay, we also had uh, visits, many visits from, for example, the heroes of uh, the standard model. And I want to say one more thing which was done in parallel was the development of all the computing infrastructure. <coughs> and that was also a big thing. And I guess one like me now, I give much too little uh, credit really to all our colleagues who work on the computing. Because without that, we would not have been able to extract the, the, the physics so quickly. Um, you know, the <coughs> Worldwide, uh, LHC computing grid is really a tiered construct with the tier zero at CERN. Then there are by now 12 tier one centers and uh, many uh, tier two centers. And of course, uh, here in house, you have one of the very active uh, tier two centers. <coughs> Absolutely essential for the physics. Now, I think telling the story of the LHC would be uh, not complete if one would not also say the one sad period in a way that was happening just in uh, September to away, just uh, 10 days after the first single beams were circulated in the machine. There was a helium well, there was a, a bad connection of the superconductor, which made the arc. There was no more superconducting. And then the helium was released, and quite one of the eight sectors was uh, essentially uh, destroyed. Uh, there's a lot of damage. You can see here uh, how these, uh, for example, two magnets, they were, they were really moved physically, and all these complicated connections, of course, were Damage, they had to be taken out. Quite a few of this matter collected, reinstalled, and so in uh, November 2009, we were ready to, to restart. And uh, you can imagine that people in the control room were rather anxious to see what happens, and uh, <laughs> we were all very, very happy when then we saw with reduced voltages of the electricity and everywhere, but we saw some clear uh, signals <coughs> from uh, collisions. So this was uh, indeed uh, 10 years ago when the first uh, collisions happened, and the high energy operation, <coughs> you <can> see, the <coughs> 3,500 GB of uh, collisions that happened in the spring afterwards. So. This was on the 30th of March. And once more, Min Evans, who was the project leader of the machine, and of course we recognized nicely Fabiola Gianotti, who was at that time leading the experiment. And we are so happy now that she is, of course, the director general. So, <coughs> um, let me come a little bit to some of the 
physics. So I told you already that uh, 1 in 10 to the 13 collision is about good for having one detectable Higgs boson. And uh, in the first, what we call run 1, from 1290 to 2012, we had essentially 2 times 10 to the 15 collision. So okay, you can already obviously know that we should have seen uh, the, the Higgs boson, which is in the case. Uh, here is another history of the, how the machine was running. Then in run two, which was from 2015 to 2018, <coughs> at the higher energy, after all these superconducting charts have been uh, verified and, and reinforced, there was a lot of work between these two runs on the machine. So you see we have in total, if you integrate all this, this was the last run in uh, 2018, we have something like 150 uh, inverse delta <coughs> A very substantial amount of data. Of course, this substantial uh, increase in the intensity also means a substantial challenge to, for example, the tracking where Typically, we have something like 30, 30 to 40 interactions per bunch crossing. And to fish out the good events needs really a very uh, able tracking detector. And uh, just to say it right away, this is of course one of the very big challenges for the upgrade when we go to even higher uh, luminosity. So, Hence, all this effort to build a new track and uh, improve the track. <coughs> so, let me just show a few of the benchmark physics uh, thing. I think the first one is really high PT jets. That's uh, the bread and butter physics to some extent of uh, high uh, energy collisions. It's, it's beautiful physics, I like that. We started off with this at the PYT collider. This is a nice uh, two-check event. At, uh, well, this is two times three uh, TV collision. And you can make very detailed comparison between cross-sections and what you predict by the uh, quantum chromodynamics by QCD. This is in itself a very uh, important aspect, of course, of measuring the, in the standard model. This is the simplest, simplest thing, it's just inclusive cross-section, but of course there are many, many more things you can look at and then compare with uh, QCD calculations and in order to compare in a more meaningful way than just in a very, very highly logarithmic scale, one typically looks, looks always about the ratio between experiment and theoretical prediction. And that's, so in the ideal case, it should be one, and then you can read off immediately how well, for example, a different angle of reaching as a function of the PT, uh, these predictions are uh, correct. Next, on the physics, uh, standard model physics case is, of course, you look at what we call kind of standard candles, the W and C bosons, of course, discovered at the PYP collider, and, uh, well, these are now just the inclusive cross-section measurements at the LHC. This was at the Teratron. This is P by P, and this black line is uh, proton proton. This was the place where it was discovered at the CERN P by P collider, and uh, this is a rig measurement. And latest result on that, with much higher uh, precision, you can see here the W uh, cross section, <coughs> all the measurements over the LHC and you see uh, cross-section. 
And just to give you the impression that sometimes people say, well, Hadron colliders are dirty machines, you can do a lot of precision measurement. And again, you can do a lot of precision measurement if you have a good instrument and an enormous dedicated workforce, if I may say so, of uh, many, many uh, physicists finding and tuning the understanding of the measurement. So these are different plots showing you, for example, as a, let's say, just one example, as a function of the angle of pseudo rapidity, the uh, reproducibility of the zimas, and you can see here the scale, uh, the precision which one works in. This is uh, 0.5, plus 0.5 percent, minus 0.5 percent. So you really describe the data to a very high accuracy. And that allows uh, you and allowed Atlas to make the first uh, W mass measurement with the same precision essentially as has been achieved in <coughs> previous measurements at the Pelotron Collider. So this is a typical uh, high precision measurement that can be done, and that will be done with even higher accuracy uh, in the uh, future. So how much time do you still give me? Ten minutes, okay. So, of course, uh, another chapter is uh, top physics. And I mentioned top physics particularly because, among others, this is uh, one of uh, certainly the highlights of the physics contribution of the Valencia group. We are very much aware of that. This is a typical uh, clean top event where the tops, well, both decay into uh, w and the B, and uh, then you have the B tagging, and the W, uh, for example, can decay into electron neutrino and neon neutrino. And uh, these are very recent measurements of the cross section with comparison to QCP calculations. You can see the, the precision being achieved. Or, and this is really only more for the, for the experts, we <coughs> can use this as a uh, mean also to measure in a somewhat less model dependent way the mass of the T quark when comparing uh, the cross section with what you would expect as a function of the mass. So this is a very recent high precision uh, measurement. These were TT bar, of course, the single top uh, production cross sections, which are very challenging, and that's something where, of course, you know much more than me, because again, uh, you have a lot of uh, input to uh, these analysis. And it's very interesting to see that actually, with uh, high precision, for example, the T channel and the TW. This process here uh, are now measured and then com be compared with uh, then with the theoretical prediction. Also, uh, the top mass uh, measurements have been pushed quite to uh, high precision. Again, uh, to a precision already surpassing the one from uh, the pebble. So, I'm skip this and go to uh, another very important aspect of the standard model, namely the uh, boson pair production. And I like this example to show that sometimes this interplay between theory and experimental uh, measurements, because actually the measurements from the LHC. <coughs> they uh, were not agreeing with the theory available at the time when they were published. And uh, then, of course, uh, higher order, we stimulated our theory colleagues to make higher order calculations. And uh, this is now the purple. 
and you can see that uh, this certainly uh, is be much better understood. This is particularly interesting because uh, this electroweak boson self-coupling that uh, could eventually show us hints for physics beyond the standard model. Now, just to tell you, there is not only boson pairs, but triple boson uh, production, which again um, includes triple and quartic gauge couplings and so on. So that's a big, interesting field. So there are many um, measurements which are done within the uh, standard model. Again, you see over many orders of magnitude in the cross section. If you get the ratio, this is a very good degree. And uh, clearly that is, uh, is a triumph for the standard model. So that also meant we understand the physics, or means we understand very much of the physics, and that allowed certainly to give a lot of strength to claim discoveries. And just to tell you, I remind you, the nicest discovery, of course, is the uh, Higgs boson, which was announced on the famous 4th of July. And then a uh, year later, immediately uh, recognized to uh, François Engel and Peter Higgs with the Nobel Prize, where Atlas and CMS experiments really were quoted even in the citation. We should be happy about that. Uh, let me just show you briefly the uh, <coughs> legacy plots in a way for the, from the run one, for the Higgs in Gamma Gamma, and the Higgs in uh, four leptons. Very clear signal, and, and actually it was celebrated, the legacy, all this, this data was celebrated two years after the discovery at this uh, nice iChip uh, conference here. Uh, in time, I'm very happy with the two second anniversary of the So I only showed you the Gamma Gamma and the Z, Z <coughs> peak. There are, of course, other parts of the decay which uh, are being studied. I've studied uh, this lots of detail. Uh, I will run out of time, so I will not really say much about that. But one thing, again, which has to be more with the historical part is uh, I think it was very good that CERN decided to have two complementary experiments. And uh, in a way, it's almost a miracle that both of these experiments were, were doing well. Uh, of course, during all the time when talking with uh, with director generals or so, they always threaten, well, if, if Atlas doesn't work, it's, we still have CMS, and I guess uh, the, the same must hold to, to uh, the CMS uh, colleagues. So, in fact, from the run one, we see that for the channels which we did in run one, the observed, uh, you can just look at the observed uh, standard deviations, they were roughly the same. <coughs> Different techniques, but very consistent results. And I show, like to show this plot because, uh, in a way, it shows that the dream in '99 when we uh, published the physics expectation for Atlas in terms of uh, the mass of the Higgs, how many standard deviations we would have actually for 100 inverse pentagram and uh, 14 TV, we already, once the machine was, was really running, we got the signal quite fast. This was uh, when in the summer uh, 2012, we got this clear signal of uh, six standard deviations already. So just to reassure you that the, the heat system there, now with uh, run two, New data, very beautiful in the four lepton channel and also in the uh, 
to climate change. There's no time to discuss the cleanliness of the So I think um, I will probably have to wind up, unfortunately. Just to show you, these are the cross-section measurements now of the Higgs. One can study a lot of things like the differential uh, distribution, for example, the PT distribution of the Higgs. And I will skip essentially over all the uh, other channels. Just to say that uh, our challenge now is to finally also observe, we have observed towns, we have observed in the DB bar. Uh, what we haven't observed yet is uh, the case into fermions in uh, the second generation. And, uh, well, that's something which, which is on the plate really for the high luminosity LHC. <coughs> I want to maybe end with uh, a slide closing somewhat the standard model uh, history, which of course uh, you all know this nice uh, book which I will just study, I just got it now from uh, Tony. In Spanish. You would have <laughs> In Spanish, I will learn Spanish. Which shows us that, uh, well, I mentioned the top quad mass measurement, W mass measurement. We have uh, the Higgs mass measurement, which is already better than 0.2%. And uh, this is a famous uh, consistency plot. It's already old, but uh, it's still valid. In fact, also with a newer, somewhat smaller errors in both the top mass and the W mass. And we see that this, so far, everything looks fine. This is uh, the plot without uh, using the, uh, uh, the Higgs, here without using the W and uh, T mass, compared to what they actually are. It's a good consistency. So, of course, one looks deeper and deeper with that, and these are typical things one would do, of course, in more with uh, a dedicated machine, which would look in particular at Higgs mass and uh, Higgs properties, W mass and uh, top mass, typically the domain of maybe a future E plus E minus collider. So, uh, I will try to skip immediately to the last slide. Um, unfortunately, there is no time to talk about uh, many things. So, So, my well, conclusion is really that the Atlas experiment and uh, this, I mean, building the instrument, operating it, and of course the physics, that has really been a rewarding journey for thousands of colleagues and of course for all the friends uh, from Valencia since the beginning. But uh, this uh, journey has only started. I mean, there is a long way to go. We have analyzed maybe of the order of 3-4% uh, of uh, the data of the LHC of what is still expected to come. So there's a lot of physics still ahead of us. I think so far the experiment has already uh, contributed a lot to exploring the, the high energy frontier. And, uh, well, 
uh, as I said, there is, there is a lot to come, and we hope, of course, for some uh, science of physics beyond the standard model, which we know all that there must be some. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. We have time for a few questions. Just raise your hand. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot for this uh, historical review of what we get uh, here. Uh, okay, I want to go back. I mean, you show this very old slide where we had this uh, staggered uh, uh, leg and then it's here. So, but then in reality, it was a bit more <laughs> dramatic. So, there was this decision of uh, stopping the leg and then going to yeah. So, how do you? I mean, what are your numbers of this uh, this uh, of this time? Uh, what do you think? Well, so you you're talking about roughly uh, two thousand or so, yeah. and uh, this was a this was a tough time. In fact, all all uh, there were kind of two clans of the left people who wanted to continue running left because there were some really not significant, but some hints of uh, possible uh, Higgs boson. I had uh, some bets with, uh, for example, the left coordinate uh, channel, button uh, channel at that time and so. Um, I think wisely enough the, the CERN management, which at that time was Luciano Magliani, was the uh, director general, and actually also the, the uh, Let's see, chair Michel Spiro, they kept their head uh, cool and uh, understood that if, if you have 1.5 sigma, 2 sigma, even if you add a year <coughs> of uh, very expensive leg running, you will not, it's impossible to come to a real conclusion. So finally, they, they made, I think, the right decision, but uh, of course, uh, I, and I was arguing strongly that uh, we must uh, stop left now to have the time to, to install the, the LHC. Well, I, I'm no, nobody, but I, I, I was helped by the fact, it, it was helped by the fact that uh, all the contractors to construct LHC, uh, to take out the machine, the left machine and so on, were already uh, essentially ready to intervene, so it would have cost a lot of money just to keep that waiting. And so, uh, but it was not an easy time, of course. Let me say, I was relieved that the Higgs was not at 150. <laughs> <laughs> so, that summarizes it, maybe. But when, given your experience with the lab and, and uh, LAC, how do you see the future after the high luminosity LSE? What would you think is the best option to take now? Well, it's a difficult question, I know. <laughs> you know, of course, the, the whole uh, discussion of the European strategy uh, ongoing uh, certainly followed this in very great detail in Granada and, and, and so. Um, well, I, I can see tell you my personal opinion is that uh, <coughs> I, I do think a E plus and minus machine to measure with great precision really the Higgs, the top eventually, and the W and C, with, that, that is certainly a very valid physics goal. And I also, however, think with not everything should be done at CERN. I think the CERN speciality is really to prepare for the high energy frontier. So my dream scenario would be that um, such a E plus and minus machine would be built in Asia, let's say this way, to start with which probably could come into operation uh, towards 
2035 or so. And I think it will be acceptable for CERN to have for some time uh, no machine if CERN would have a very clear plan with a <coughs> large tunnel and the kilometer tunnel or so to go and work fully on uh, a proton proton collider in the range of uh, 100 TV. And ideally, of course, one would do this in, in a mutual uh, collaboration with all the regions in, in the world. To be explicit, I mean, there, there are clearly a lot of uh, expertise in Europe for e plus e minus machines that could help uh, and participate, and physicists could do experiment at, uh, at such a machine. I haven't said yet which one. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and uh, however, I must also say, being often in, in, in Asia, and in China in particular, they have quite Establishing um, progress also in, in uh, different approaches to high field magnets, which I think Europe could be interested in. So there could be a, a give and take somewhere. Now I will, I will also put my foot out on the uh, on the question of plus and minus machine. Um, I, I think a, a ring collider would, if we just think of the physics and no politics, nothing else, I think it would be a better machine than a linear collider just in terms of luminosity, but also in terms of having two experiments. And I think for precision measurement, that I think is, maybe the luminosity is not that strong an argument, but to have two different experiments I think it will be a, a plus, which is something which unfortunately at the linear collider we don't have. So, but, but either one will be very good, of course. I will be delighted if Japan could, could build the ILC. But I also think we should not uh, put uh, away this uh, CPC in China right away. Okay, well, I'll move over to Pilar. I want to remark that the ILC design precedes two experiments. I don't think it's yeah, the but, but best that, thing to do. Yeah, they but share that, the nobody movie. takes this serious. I mean, I, I would say that it's politically right what you're saying, but if you, if you dig in, I don't think this, because of course you then not only split the luminosity, which is already low, but you also have to foresee to, to move experiments. To have two, two channels is very expensive. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's okay. better ways to make sure that you physicists are honest right. than building two experiments, probably. So, uh, about what you just said, so I, I take it as, uh, you know, it is likely then that you would have, uh, you know, this very long uh, tunnel, circular tunnel, both in Asia and in uh, CERN. Is that the idea? I mean, is that on the table? Well, I think that is realistic. I, well, of course, first of all, I, I'm only talking in this matter. Yeah, private, yeah. private person. Yeah, you don't want to. Now, I, I do think this is not completely excluded because the and that has now to do with the uh, somewhat the political context because for the Chinese project, um, first of all, they're really very impressive what I have seen just two weeks ago, three of the firms presenting what they would do. There are six sites at the moment in China for this. Um, they would do it on their own, the tunnel in particular. So it, it's, it's an illusion to think that, uh, well, uh, they would pay for a tunnel here or something. That, that I think. So it, this is not in our hands. If they will build the tunnel, that they will do it anyhow. So no, but, but the, I point, the question is, if there is such a tunnel in, in yeah, China, how are you going to convince uh, European because, politicians that you have to do the same? But, because Europe would want. I think to keep 
the, the leadership in, in, the, in all the technology needed for, for such a large, uh, very large Hadron Collider. By the way, I don't think China would be in any position now to build themselves uh, a Hadron Collider, the machine, the tunnel, yes. And the E plus A minus machine, I also think they would be able to do it. Of course, with uh, collaboration with European and American, uh, and, and I think this collaboration would come. Uh, for a Hadron Collider, I don't think they have. That is, this is too far away. So I, I think you would have to argue that uh, Europe should keep the leadership uh, really in the technology, but also in the physics of, uh, of problem problem. Now, just to tell you one more thing, which is uh, in, and this is not the secret or so, in, in advising the Chinese and the CPC, I have said several times, build a 60 kilometer tunnel, concentrate on it as in mind. Of course, thinking that to avoid this, this problem of two times a tunnel of 100 kilometers. Okay. And I think that that would be the right, would have been, I still believe that would have been the right thing for them to do. And it would also be cheaper for them. There would be not this competition which we are in now. Okay, so um, in, in this context, if you think this would be uh, something that would happen, uh, and okay. you have to think of, uh, you know, next steps towards that, to, towards realizing any of these, like uh, uh, circular plus and minus machine, for example. I mean, what would, do you think, where are the challenges uh, on the side of detector development that needs to be addressed in a, you know, in a short uh, term or medium term? Well, I think there is, in fact, for the, for the E plus and minus, both for the IOC a lot, and also for the green machine, there is a lot of uh, development going on. I mean, there, there is some, some changes. For example, now, as um, people are becoming much more aware that one should also go, again, lower in energy, the WW threshold or the C peak, uh, some of the technologies which were initially foreseen, like TPCs or so, are less likely. Uh, so people in, invest in detector concepts, which essentially, of course, silicon tracking, essentially. Uh, there, there is quite some R&D going on. So I'm, I would not be uh, afraid of believing that for the ISC or CPC, people will know how to do that at that time, when after some R&D, they could do that. For a Hadron Collider, there, is, there, are more, there are more challenges. There are the big challenges also on components you are maybe less interested, but quite interested in the magnet, for example. That's a, <coughs> it is a huge magnet, and so one is needing. Uh, there, there is a lot of things to, to develop. Also, I think in, in the calorimetry, one should, uh, should go maybe new avenues in calorimetry. I, I can just throw in a, a, a catch word if we look what it is. It's, it's this uh, dual readout calorimetry, which is really very different from what, what we do. But for a Hadron Collider, it could be a, an interesting approach where you measure event by event the electromagnetic component and the hydraulic component. And you don't have, and you have a high uh, lateral segmentation, so in electron hadron separation works on paper beautifully. And it's completely opposite to what people develop for, for example, in Kali's, this uh, high granular color. This will be no depth segmentation, quite revolutionary. One more question. <coughs> <coughs>
No? Okay, then. Sorry, I got so. I would like to thank you again, Peter. It was, it was very nice. It was exactly what we needed to celebrate 10 years of, of the LHC. And uh, of course, your role in Atlas has become clear. And uh, I think for young people, it's, it's important to see that these things didn't just appear <coughs> overnight. And right, these things are there because people 25 years ago stuck out their neck and made it happen. Thank you. <laughs>